Oh, I see it. Angela. And welcome to my living room, by the way. Yeah, this yes. is a different angle than uh, we saw when Mike was doing his. I think wasn't it? Yep, he was in our he was in our East Wing. Oh, okay. You kept him in his his cave. We have a thousand square foot home. He was in the East Wing. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the East Wing. <laughs> I love it. Oh, hey, welcome everybody to the Fall Line with Chaos and Company. I'm here with my buddy Angelo Ross. I'm Dave Capron, and we have an absolutely awesome special guest tonight. Robin Barnes is here all the way from California. Hello. How are you doing, Robin? Hey, gentlemen. Good evening. Great to, great to see your faces. Great to hear your voices. Tonight should be fun. Angela, what's up, man? I'm not feeling a lot of pressure now that she said it should be fun. <laughs> <laughs> As you maintain that stoic expression you like to use. Yes, yeah. he does. <laughs> my, my resting bitch face. <laughs> <laughs> I have a great, a great, a great face for radio. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's he's, why he's the, ready to roll tonight, though. Those. That's why the uh, podcast platforms get more hits that people don't have to look at us. <laughs> yeah, that's right, man. <laughs> they don't see us. Oh God. Hey, Robin. Thanks for coming on. We we want to start where we kind of started with everybody that's been coming on, and just how did skiing begin for you? You know, how old were you when you learned and who brought you to the sport and uh, did you learn by yourself or, or did someone help you? Oh, good question. Um, a little bit of both. So the first time I ever skied was in Pat's Peak, New Hampshire, where I had some cousins that were going with some friends and they invited me along. So I went and I was like a terror. I didn't take a lesson. I remember there was a, um, a tea bar at the time. And I would fall off the T-bar and end up in the, this ditch. And the guy would have to come fish me out and put me back in my skis and send me down. And I would careen into the line of people. And I, was, <laughs> I just had a blast. And I remember getting to ride a chairlift by myself and thinking it was the coolest thing ever. Um, that was my first experience skiing. And then I had another experience, probably not so unlike that, when I was like 12 or 13. And then again, when I was like 15 or 16. In junior high school, I joined the ski club where once or twice a year, we would take a bus up and do a weekend trip. Um, I also didn't take lessons then. And then in, I guess, high school, I got a part-time job at a CVS pharmacy at, at the mall close to where I lived and met a fellow employee who had a group of friends that would go skiing each weekend. And so I became friends with them. And we did a lot of weekend ski trips and same thing. I, they all had grown up skiing and I was like the tin can at the back of the newlyweds bumper, just following them around, trying to, <laughs> trying to keep up, but learned so much from that experience. Again, they were all good skiers. Um, I guess I had some athleticism and a lot of grit. Uh, and I think probably to this day, those folks have no idea how influential they were to me during those times to introduce me to mountains, to skiing. Um, yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot to thank for those folks doing that. That's awesome. Hey, someone that didn't learn in uh, Pennsylvania, I'm psyched. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like, see, yeah. Look happen. at his head. He's shaking his head. Oh god! It's like everybody that's come on the podcast. Like I learned in Pennsylvania. I grew up in Pennsylvania. It's like I, th I think uh, he's been stacking the deck on me. So I'm psyched. Pat's Peak, New Hampshire. Did you hear that, Angelo? Pat's Peak, New Hampshire. Yeah, New yeah, Hampshire. Did you hear that? Hampshire. Yeah. Sounds like a lobster <laughs> fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I skied in New Hampshire oh. because I grew up in Massachusetts. So I can say Pat speak New Hampshire like the best of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so skiing was was pretty big. The weekend kind of things you're growing up as you're saying. Was there any racing in your background through high school or? No, probably by the time I taught my first lesson, I probably hadn't skied a hundred days in my life. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Right. Shocking. Um, <laughs> like I grew up, I grew up with three big brothers huh? and people always say, Oh, you must've been a princess growing up then. And no, not at all. My brothers kept me tough and kept me on my toes. And we played outdoors all the time, whether it was building forts or throwing a baseball around or behind our house in the winter time would flood and we would put on our hockey skates and go out and play. So we were always active and outside, but, um, Nobody else in my immediate family skis. Uh -huh. So uh, played hockey in the backyard and what other kind of sports were in your background and when you were young? 
Oh, so growing up, um, I had a stint of figure skating mm-hmm. and I did some gymnastics. Again, my brothers and I played, played baseball and we had a big field in our front yard a lot. Did some horseback riding with some of my girlfriends, but there was no, there was no sport that I just did full on super yeah. active all the time. Played, got home from school, you know, put on your play clothes and went outside and just played outdoors all the time. Um, but not, not necessarily my sports came later in life. So, so when did you start teaching? Started teaching. So growing up, I was sort of always looking at the horizons and I always knew something else was out there. And when I was going to school part time in Massachusetts, um, I decided I should go back to school full time in California. Just thought, let me just try something different and stopped in Lake Tahoe. I drove across the country, stopped in Lake Tahoe for what was supposed to be a few days, which turned into a few weeks, which turned into, um, hello at the human resources office. Do you have a job I can do for the rest of the season? Uh-huh. This is a fairly typical Tahoe story. <laughs> um, which turned into at the end of that season, I got offered a job the next season to come back and teach skiing. And I thought, wow, that would be amazing because I can barely ski myself. <laughs> um, and then, so of course I went through the whole training course and whatnot. Uh, I remember during that, the learn to be an instructor clinic, skiing with a man by the name of Don Evans, who I was awestruck with because he had thighs like tree trunks. He was this beautiful skier. And I remember him talking about the outside ski and I didn't really get it, but I kind of was like quiet and I like thought about it for a while. And then we took another run and I was like, Oh, that's the coolest thing ever. <laughs> oh. so, so what was the, well, what hooked you with teaching? Like skiing you loved, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> but what, what hooked you with the, with the teaching? Was it the, the interaction with others? Was it sharing the sport? Was it, that you could ski all the time. I know when I first started, I was like, yeah, I can go ski for free. For sure. All of the above. For sure. <laughs> but I remember the first lesson I gave, like it was yesterday. And I had 20 first time skiers that I had for two hours in the morning. Then they had an hour break and another two hours in the afternoon. Um, and I just remember from having had the training class of how to be an instructor. I remember thinking, holy smokes, the things I say and do affect how they learn to do this. And I was fascinated by that. I was hooked, of course, watching somebody get turned on to a sport that I already was pretty excited about. Um, yes, of course, the interaction with the peers, the camaraderie, um, that same thing to this day. You know, I can remember going to the ski resort at 7.30 and doing an indoor clinic and then we'd go out on the snow and play with some topics and then go apply that in our own skiing and our lessons and I kind of like learning things. And so everything about it was really attractive to me. So how, what did you do along the journey? What did you do to study? What did you read? Was it a lot of interactions with people like Don Evans that you got the technical stuff and, and how did the technical and teaching blend together through your journey? How did the technical and teaching blend together? Yeah, you know, I mean, did, was it like you really went out there and learned about some technical stuff on skiing and like the outside ski that Don was talking about? Or was there kind of a blend of you're trying to figure out how to coach people at the same time you're learning the technical stuff of skiing? I think probably early on, I spent more focus on the technical stuff. I read everything. I asked questions. I took clinics. Um, and then based on on maybe something like learning that the outside ski was a thing in a clinic, then it made me be able to apply that to teaching. So I think that's how I learned a lot. And then how I coached that helped me understand how to apply it in my own skiing more. I think early on, probably I was more focused on the technical stuff. I read everything, like every manual I could get my hands on. Um, at that time, there were still sheets of paper, right? Copy yeah, pieces right. of paper on, on physics and biomechanics and anatomy and everything. Um, ATS, ATM, every manu- manual you can think of. Um, I would read that and then I would write down questions and go out and <laughs> another trainer, Steve Evanson, who's still one of our most, um, and my trainers in the Western Division, um, 
particularly when I was training for my level three, every day when we finished work, I'd be like, Steve, Steve, you're going to go ski the face or you're going to go ski the face? And the face at Heavenly is this really long bump run. And every day after work, you could get a couple of extra runs in there because you download that chairlift. Most guests download the chairlift to get to the bottom of the mountain and we could ski it. So they kept the chairlift running later, which meant we could take a couple of extra laps. And I would just go, Steve, let's go take a run. Come on, Steve, let's go do this. And, and he entertained me and he was a really big mentor for me at that time. Um, another clinician trainer who was super influential for me is a guy named Ted Pitcher, who has been influential in the adaptive training um, all around the country. But he's been one of our top trainers and top examiners in this region too. And I remember this was probably, this was probably my first season and we were out skiing and he yelled, Barn, stop skiing like a girl. And I'm like, but Ted, I am a girl. And he goes, you are not, you're a woman, ski like one. <laughs> and it just kind of made me say, okay, he thinks there's more to this than what I'm giving myself credit for and ski strong, ski with determination. Um, and both of those guys have had a big influence on me, but that one, you are not, you're a woman, ski like one. Um, to this day, sometimes I go, okay, come on, let's get this job done. And Ted was definitely one of the influ influencers in that. Um, I think probably as I've developed in my career, I've probably started to pay more attention to learning theory and how we teach, how we coach. Um, and one of the, my biggest resources there is I run a ski school in the summertime in Portillo, Chile, a snow sports school. <clears throat> and there's, depending on the year, sometime between somewhere between 40 and 50 instructors from about 15 different countries. And 95% of them are at least level three certified from their country. And so it's just this amazing resource of, well, how do you do this? Well, that's interesting. How do you do this? Austria looks at it this way. Switzerland looks at it this way. Igor from Slovenia looks at it this way. Um, Heidi from St. Moritz looks at it this way. And so you get to show it's like a melting pot and a, um, kind of a litmus test to see how people are doing, how you're thinking about things, both relative to teaching and about ski technique. That's been a huge influence in my life. I was pausing because Angel is right now, but I, I know he has a question. He's got something he's formulated. Yeah, I, I'm just surprised your backstory. I, I thought you were going to say you came out of the womb with skis on, a pair of head skis, actually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, Dave? That's um, right, Ed. Yeah. No, I, um, do you ever get imposter syndrome? I'm, my background is similar. I did my, none of my immediate family skis and i find myself sometimes looking around the room at training and, and whatnot i'm like i don't really feel like i should be here do you ever you ever deal with that oh absolutely i think we all do i think it's healthy too yeah right imposter syndrome meaning that you're wondering are you the real deal do you really know enough to have this job one of my favorite quotes um, which I believe is a church vote is when you're asked if you can do a job, say absolutely, and then get busy and figure out how to do it. Right. And I think, okay, I think it's okay to go, I've got work ethic. I've got afraid to roll my sleeves up. I'm not afraid to, to fail and, and learn from that. Um, and so, I, I mean, I have... All my life, I feel like I've gotten in over my head and had to figure out how to figure it out. Um, taking over the job in Portillo, Chile as the snow sports school director with an unbelievably talented staff. And the last three directors prior to me, no four, have not been Olympic athletes, but all the other ones historically since the 60s were. Um, and the other ones were um, a guy by the name of Hartnett from Sugarbush, Jimmy Ackerson, Michael Rogan, Jesus Puente. Um, those are pretty big shoes. And so, yes, absolutely. I think questioning whether or not you're the right person is healthy. If it gets to the point where you're so insecure, you're thinking, no, I'm not here. Well, maybe you're in the wrong place, right? Um, but I think it's healthy to question. I think it's humility to question whether you're not in the right place. Um, I think 
yes, I question that sometimes, but in the end, I feel pretty confident. Um, I've got a lot of ski seasons under my belt from having spent 30 something years in South America. Um, and again, I feel like I've, I've, I've worked hard. I've put myself in places and around people where I've gotten to learn things. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable in my shoes, but, but yeah. And again, I think imposter syndrome to a degree can be healthy for us. Do you think that sometimes being that involved that full time for that many years? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, that, that <laughs> do you, do you think, um, do you find it maybe sometimes, um, hard to relate to instructors who are weekenders? Um, you're coming from a really, really different place with your like immersion in this, in this lifestyle. And and in the States, it's predominantly a weekender gig. Um, Do do you you have to remind yourself sometimes when you're working with instructors that, that, you know, they're they're not uh, 300 days on snow every Uh, year. It's it's funny. I just did a, a presentation on empathy for the national team. And one of my points in that was as a national team member, you have to be able to relate to the person that does a week of all day privates in Jackson Hole, as well as the person who does one hour lessons, whether they're group or private, predominantly on 200 vertical feet. Um, and they're both, both ends of that spectrum are amazing and awesome and beautiful in their own way. Um, maybe Angela, maybe when I first started traveling around a lot, and I had to, you know, take a step back and, rec- and put myself in the person's shoes and go, okay, what is it that teaching skiing means to them? What is it that training means to them so that I can best accommodate that and we can work together? Um, again, I think I've been around long enough that that's maybe more natural for me to, to recognize that now. Um, I remember once going to Boston Mills in Ohio which is a very small place and people would, would take that run and stop three or four times on a 200 vertical foot run. And again, that's how they were skiing that mountain. It took a little while to go, okay, we're working on something new. Let's do five or six laps and then check in. Right. So there's, we all get guilty of the same thing where we go to our home mountain and we ski the route that's common and the route that's popular and the route that everybody likes. and I know when I show up at a different resort to train instructors, um, part of what I do is try to shake that up. Like, let's not go down this the same way that you always do. It's good for us. It's healthy for us to be diverse and mix things up and get out of our own rhythm. Um, Even given that instructors from smaller mountains that are predominantly weekend resorts can have a different experience than the bigger mountains, hundred percent. Neither is better nor worse. You've given a lot of presentations while you've been on the team. <laughs> um, at least I, I, I've seen a lot. I mean, you can go on YouTube and you go on the PSA site and, you know, whether it's Interski or National Academy, um, has, has that been um, one of your roles in the team? Um, did you ask for it? How did, how did that come about? Um, <laughs> she's like, I don't know. <laughs> Nope, definitely didn't ask for it. Rock, pa- um, rock paper, scissors. <laughs> rock paper, scissors. <laughs> so, I love challenges. Like, and I again, I think as I gain experience in life, I've taught myself to lean into the things that are uncomfortable, like being on podcasts with you two. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <sighs> And let's face it, public speaking can scare the daylights out of somebody. I was the kid in school who, when a teacher said, you know, what's the answer to this question? I was a pretty good student, so I always knew the answer, but I could never get myself to raise my hand. Scare the daylights out of me. Um, if I was called on, because the better teachers recognized the kids that wouldn't do that on their own and get called on, my face would turn this color red. <laughs> And I would be so embarrassed and it would take everything I had to answer the question. So being in front of people and answering questions like that was never something that came natural for me. 
Um, I did, I guess, the first big one I gave at Interski, I did request back because I wanted that challenge that was, you know, to present something about skiing in front of your international peers was a huge challenge that I was looking forward to taking on. Uh, another big one that I did was at National Academy a few years ago. Um, and I can tell you that when I was walking up to the microphone, I could not have remembered my name if you asked me. I was so flipping nervous. Um, sweaty palms, heart rate going a gazillion miles an hour. Um, I can also be kind of a logical person. And I recognize that when your heart rate's going a gazillion miles an hour, it's because your body's saying, it's go time, sister, let's get this done, right? So being kind of a logical person, when I get nervous like that, I say, okay, that's what's supposed to happen. This is helping me get ready for this, um, which kind of helps to turn it around. And then I think every time I'm giving a presentation, like a presentation that's that's important and people are listening and I have to sound like I can link thoughts. Um, there's two things I think about. One is that nobody wants to see me fail. Nobody out in the audience wants to go, but I hope she really messes this one up. And the other one is I'm going to feel way more comfortable up in front of you all if I feel like I'm giving you something. And so if my content is delivering something that I feel like will be useful to you, it's going to make me a lot more comfortable in front of you because it's no longer about me. It's about what can I give to my audience that's going to make them understand something differently, have something to apply tomorrow, um, et cetera. I'm trying to think of an exception to that. Can't come up with one right now. But those are the two things that kind of keep me, it's not about me. <laughs> so was it the uh, 2017? Academy you're talking about with the, um, I think the presentation was on co uh, getting yourself to a higher level of yes. performance. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for knowing that. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. about taking responsibility for your development. Yeah. Yeah. I, and, you know, Angela and I have tried to talk about that a little bit this year. I, um, I, Angela, if you've watched that, we definitely didn't um, do it as well as she did in the presentation. That's why I was going to ask her, if, you know, if, you know, what were some of the bullets of that? Because I know you still remember the bullets or, or what was some of the things you you'd say from that presentation for people how to reach that higher level. Cause we've been trying to get people to do that. And, uh, you know, Angela and I just haven't got it done yet. Uh -huh. hmm. <laughs> uh, I think one of my messages from that was about student centered, because one of the things that we do so wonderfully as an organization is deliver student centered experiences. So if this family is coming to, to ski at Pat's Peak for the week. Um, we make sure we are catering to them, whether they want to learn to slide rails or ski moguls or look good down an intermediate run. Like we make sure we are catering to their needs so that at the end of each day, they feel pretty successful. But sometimes I wonder, have we taken that to the nth degree when it comes to us training other instructors or other instructors taking training? Where if I'm going to ski with you for arguably, if it's only one time, maybe, but I'm going to ski with you more than one time, whether it's today and tomorrow or in December and again in February, it's okay if you're a little bit frustrated at the end of the day, because we're going to be able to figure it out. And if you're a little bit frustrated because you didn't get it yet, you're going to be hungry and you're going to think about it and you're going to be driving your car down the road and be like, ah, oh, here it is. Or you're going to be teaching a beginner lesson and, and feel a movement or watch them do something and go, that was it. Um, so I think that we don't have to deliver everything all the time. We can let people suffer and we can be willing to suffer a little bit ourselves in figuring something out. So student center right, doesn't yeah. necessarily mean catering and making sure that you feel like you're successful after every run or even every day. It's, it's a longer term game than that. And it's about having the relationship that says, Dave, you might be pissed off at me right now. You might be frustrated. You might go to the locker room and throw your poles in the corner. Um, and then once you calm down a little bit, we'll have a talk about it and we'll work through the next step. And at the end of it, 
we're both going to be that much better. And your, your performance, your skiing, everything's going to be better from that. So mm. that was one of my messages from that. Yeah. And that, that's, a, that's, a, that happens in education generally. I, I think the, these days, and it's, it's interesting to hear you talk, your, your development. I think when you said, you know, early on, you glommed onto the technical bit. And I think that's really typical for new teachers. I remember as a new classroom teacher, my concern was the biology, not the, not the people in the room. But then as you become more comfortable with the content, you start to, you know, may look up one day and you go, Oh my God, there are people in this room, you know, and, and then you, you realize, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> there are people in this ski lesson I'm teaching. Um, I think that's a natural development for, for teachers. And it seems to be how the organization has developed over decades, which isn't surprising because it's made of people too, but early on things are very technical. And now we have a, a people skills uh, uh, pillar to the, the learning connection. Um, but I think the point is some, sometimes, or maybe often, maybe, yeah, may, maybe often in American education, we, we land, we err too much on the side of customer service, you know, which is fine. Like you say, if you have a family who comes to the mountain and they want to have fun for one day, and they're going to update their Facebook profile picture. And then tomorrow they're going, you know, bowling and then they're going to rent, you know, fat bikes the next day. Like that's one thing, but instructors training for, uh, certification exams need to be handled a little bit differently. And I think need to have a different expectation of themselves. Like you're saying, like you're going to suffer. There's going to be a part of this where you're pissed, you're frustrated you know, it's raining, you're outside anyway. And, and that's, that's an important piece to address. You know, I think people, people, ski instructors, specifically snowboard instructors need to understand that there's going to be some effort involved, you know, there's going to be some effort involved. And I think the best coaches are the ones that set those expectations early. Like, yes, there's going to be some days where I'm going to ask you to do most of the work here and you might get a little bit frustrated. You might, uh, and that's part of the process. Please be assured that I'm with you there the whole time. Mm -hmm. If you, if you let someone get frustrated and, and get low on themselves and their self-esteem goes and their frustration gets too far and they think that they're alone in that process, mm -hmm. then that's not very productive. Right. But if you set the expectations where some days you're going to feel like a champ, some days you're going to feel like a chump. Right. But we're here. This is this is our partnership that we're going to work through this together. And whether it's, you know, literally you and me or or the instructor and the training staff, um, it's really important to know that, yes, that's part of the process. I'm not leaving you on your own with this one. Um, I'm here for you. We got this together. I think that's a really important part of that. Development and relationship knowing that's going to allow someone to be more likely to want to take those risks too. Like if I feel like every day I need to ski better and every day I need to ski well, I'm not going to take risks with my movements. Mm -hmm. If I can afford to take risks and some days just be like, I don't even know what my left ski and my right ski are anymore. Forget about the outside ski thing. <laughs> um, it's important to know that it's a process and that there's somebody there with you to guide you through that. One of my, all time favorite quotes is a master teach you, or wait, <laughs> let me see if I can not mess this up. A master teacher shows you where to look, but not what to see. Interesting. That's one. my favorite quotes that I feel like, especially the last bunch of years I've been living by. Dave, you were going to say something. No, I, I, I think that's awesome because um, I would just. That was I, that quote. I got. I was going to say I got to write that down, but we've got it recorded, so I can listen to it again. So I don't have to write it down. But um, yeah, I wanted to to stick with the people skills thing here because um, and and kind of go to a little bit of of um what I've watched um at Pro Jam Masters Academy that um I definitely you know I try to be observant and and look at what the team members are doing. I've seen you a lot at at Pro Jam doing your Masters Academy level level threes and um. There's definitely 
when I watch you, it definitely to me seems like even before we were talking about people skills and having it part of one of our learning, our part of our learning connection, you're, you were very aware of that, that you didn't just say hello to people or, you know, kind of go by and give them the wave. You really interacted with a lot of the people there, even people outside of the master's academy, when you're coming through the room, when there's 500 in there, um, was that, was that, is that something that you've worked hard on? You're, you've been aware of for a long time or has it been a process? Uh, that's an awesome thing to ponder. Um, I think since we've developed people skills and, and put that on the forefront and said what our fundamentals and whatnot are, I think I've gotten way better at interacting with people. I think I've gotten way more self-aware and, and manage things better. Um, yeah, like, like, like leaps and bounds, just being aware of it. Um, I probably now, just in the last couple of years, understand what Stu Campbell told me two decades ago. Um, I never really got it where he said, I was trying to decide, I was teaching skiing. Um, as a fairly requested instructor, so I was making good money when requests and got offered a job to be a supervisor. And so I went to seek his advice about, you know, Stu, what do you think? Should I stay being a ski instructor? I really love it. Or would it be good to be a supervisor when I can, you know, develop my leadership skills? Um, and he was kind of sharing pros and cons with me. But one thing that he said, he goes, as an instructor, and I think you would do this also as a supervisor, you're a really good listener. And I thought, all right. <laughs> um, I really don't think up until a couple of years ago when I started really thinking about my own people skills and, and how I communicate with people, I didn't really understand what he meant. And I think now that's what he meant, that, that I do tend to listen to people. And um, also part of the presentation I did the other day on empathy was talking about how important it is to be fiercely curious about people and their stories. Um, and I think that curiosity that I have, I, I love to know where people are from, what they do, what other languages do they speak? What sports do they do? Um, so, so maybe naturally I'm attracted to that, Dave. Um, but I can tell you, I feel like I've improved my people skills leaps and bounds in the last couple of years by being aware of it and, and understanding how to coach it certainly makes us better at applying and practicing it. But thank you for that great compliment. Who knew you were watching? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Angela will tell you, he's found out I watch a little more than people think. But yeah, I mean, it is. I mean, you can see of anybody that's in the room, even the regular instructors of some people engage and some don't. Some are kind of, they got their mode. I got to get to my group. I got to go here. I got to do this. And like, they can tune in and out. And then there are quite a few that, you know, don't tune out during the day. They don't tune out in those moments when just somebody comes up that you're not skiing with that asks you something or says hello. Yep. And I think that's also our job as team members, right? Um, the In that events case, the Eastern Division brings a handful, sometimes a dozen team members, flies us there to coach the group. I take that really seriously. Like people take time out of their family life, out of their jobs, out of whatever to, to spend time with, with you guys that are coaching it and us as team members, um, I think that's a really big deal. And I don't take that for granted even a little teeny bit. So if a 30-second conversation or a 30-minute conversation can influence that person's life or career or how they look at something, um, we should be doing that. I can tell you, um, before I got my level three exam, I was at an event someplace and Dave Manitor, who was on the team at the time, said, you know, you're not even a level three yet. You have a lot of work to do, but I could see you on the national team someday. And I was a level two ski instructor, right? That was huge. That was, you know, three minutes of his time. And it had a profound effect on my life. And so you never know when those little conversations have a big effect. You an introvert or an extrovert? 
Um, I'm an introvert. Yeah. Isn't but it amazing? It. I love being around people. Like I, yeah. COVID has been super hard, right? For a lot of us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I definitely recharge by myself. But I'll, I'll, I mean, teaching skiing, coaching skiing, being around people. It's good stuff. I'll tell you that in the 2000, either eight or 12 team, we did the little Myers Briggs test for all the team members, um, for all the different disciplines. And out of that entire group, there was either one or two extroverts. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, right? Yeah. yeah. We've been talking about that a little bit, Angelo. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> so, are you are you doing exams still? I haven't done a PSIA exam mm -hmm. in a bunch of years. In a bunch of years. Yeah. Do you think that the process is um, uh, a little easier for extroverts to get through? Because I, I think it may be. Why? Um, I think introverts are misinterpreted sometimes. Well, you, you process differently, you take a step back from the group to let it sink in, and that can be seen as disinterest or, or you know, distraction or something else. Yep. But it's interesting because it, you know, the reason I ask is because public school is like that. And we, when I taught, we did the, we did the, the, the inventory from myers Briggs, and it's like um the system is set up to um i think it's a little easier for extroverts to navigate even the 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 uh no this is in public school we i don't think we do this too much in psia clinics but going up to kids like what's wrong you're so quiet and there, there's nothing wrong it's just a quiet human you know yeah. but most of the teachers in our building were introverts like the system was set up differently than the people it attracted to come there to to work, and I always found that fascinating. It sounds like that's what you found on the with that particular team too when you did the the inventory. Probably, and I, I guess that brings us right back to people skills, right? And social and self awareness and management. I can tell you that when I'm in a training environment, when I'm being coached, if I am really digging what we're doing. I go, I get so introspective. Um, but I've learned that about myself. And so what I need to do is I will grab the group leader, whoever he or she is, and say, just so you know, here's how I process stuff. So if I'm quiet, it's not because, you know, don't get offended by it. It's not disinterest. It's just how I need to process. Um, and so that lets them not worry about well, what's with her? Why isn't she involved with this? Um, and again, that's that's one of those, I'm self-aware of that. And the way I manage it is through doing this. Of course, are there times where I can't, I can't do that and I have to go get out of my comfort zone again and lean into something that makes me a little uncomfortable and go, I can't, for optics right now, I can't be that introspective person that looks a little bit aloof. I have to portray the image of being 100% engaged, even though my way of being engaged is by being introspective. Um, so again, that's just managing it, being aware of it and, and managing it. I don't... Again, self... I think introverted people aren't necessarily quiet. They're quiet sometimes. Um, they're quiet. You go to a party, they're the person that's maybe sitting with the dog or... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but introverted people sometimes walk in too and they're like, boom, here I am, because that's the way they know how to manage it. They know how to manage the fact that that makes them uncomfortable by going, okay, here I go, boom. Um, listen, <laughs> listen to people, have dialogue with people. Yeah. That's why the crew says I'm not an introvert, but I'm like, no, yes, I am. Yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> When summer comes, I'm just a hermit. So, yes, very much so. Like right now in the greenhouses, just being the wife, transplanting. Uh, but we, we, we have, yeah, but Angela will tell you, we've been, um, we've been chatting about this, but it's been like a lot of the gang, we've been uh, 
doing calls. We did one last night just to try to get everybody together because we haven't seen each other. And um, a lot of the crew on there, the staff are, you know, more the introvert, but they, we haven't seen each other in God since last November for some of us. Right. Um, November before, you know, year, more than a year. Uh, so it's been crazy, but yeah, it, it's interesting. The, we've been talking a lot this year in the podcast about the introvert, extrovert and um, how people handle that. Um, Cause we've been looking, Angela, and I've been talking about even off the podcast of how we ask questions and how fast we want the response from people. Um, can people process an MA situation and talk while they're watching it? Or do they need to be more that introspective and not speak while the person's skiing? Um, some of those things of how they relate to those situations. Yeah, hundred percent agree. And if you're the person that that needs to process before you say it, yeah. you better practice the process. If the if that's not how you by default do it well, but that's what's expected of you, you have to press practice the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, could the exam format be made to accommodate both types of people? Probably. Um, but again, just because by default you are one way doesn't mean you can't overcome that. Right. That, and a, that's and a, two, a two, two way effort is, is probably appropriate there. The effort on the part of the candidate to recognize what they're uh, predisposed toward Right. And yep. self-awareness and, and self-management, but then on the part of the examiners to be aware that people do that differently. I, I was in, a, in an exam last year where one of the participants was um, looking somewhere else, tapping the pole. And one of the, the, the examiner I was with was a little got a little bit chuffed. It was like like uh, went chapped his ass a little. It was like a kid's not paying attention. And I said, you know, you know what? I bet if you ask him, he heard everything you said, and he did. And he he asked him, and, and and the kid repeated, you know, pretty much verbatim. But it was just, you know, th that's kind of where I come from. I sort of process the same way that kid did, you know. But I think that you know these people skills raise the bars on on evaluators on on us to really really not only uh, recognize how. Um, other people might process information, but how we judge people based on what we see on the surface, because it's not not always what's going on inside. This person is different from me. Yeah. They must not be paying attention. Or this person is different from me. They must be cocky or whatever versus really getting down to the root of it. Again, it, it comes down to asking questions. Yeah. Be fiercely curious and, and listen to the answers. So who's your favorite person to get ski coaching from or favorite couple to get ski coaching from? Huh? Um, well, probably no surprise, but the person that I throw ideas past the most um, is Michael. And, and, you know, he and I can have a conversation over dinner about skiing, whether it's about his skiing or my skiing or skiing in general. Um, and just a, a 10 minute conversation can go a long way. Speak of the devil. He's, he's just coming home. So he's probably going to walk in the door any second. <laughs> um, another person I love talking to about skiing and have, uh, when he was in Portillo, Chile, a couple of years ago, he came and did a clinic for the staff there it was Sasha Rerick, former U S men's team coach. Hi. <laughs> Um, this isn't going to count as Michael's fourth podcast if he ends up on camera. Yeah, yeah, a, cam a cameo <laughs> appearance. <laughs> hey, he went back out. He put down takeout food and went back out the door. He <laughs> ran. Like, um, <laughs> I've had enough of those guys. He's I'm not getting out. <laughs> the hell, there's those but, idiots. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to think of. I mean, the times where I'm in the environment where I'm getting coached um, are certainly few and far between. They tend to happen more in, in a conversation or in a, maybe we're even at, at, at master's Academy, right? And maybe uh, Jennifer Simpson and I, or, or Eric Lipton and I have had a conversation, right? And then I can know he's on the chairlift or she's on the chairlift and take a turn at the end of the day, go, okay, that's what I was talking about. 
And so it can be those little, little interactions that can keep us fed for months, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's, it's again, it's taking responsibility for your own outcomes, right? And saying, what do you think about this? Or, Hey, I saw you doing that. I really like that. Talk to me about that. Um, and then you get maybe literally six turns together and you're like, Oh, got that. Okay. And then you might not see each other for six months. And then that conversation picks up and you're like, I've been playing with that. Here's how I see it. Um, they're, they're little simple nuggets that you chew on and you digest and you take another bite off um, for months or years. And that can be relative to skiing or it can be relative to coaching. I think, again, we are on a... um you're on a pretty good wave right now in this organization of being aware of how we're coaching and even more importantly, how we are facilitating learning. And, and has that phrase become cliche? Maybe it shouldn't because that's our job. We should be, we shouldn't be called ski instructors or ski teachers or ski coaches. We should be called how to make people learn first, <laughs> right? Cause that's, that's, Ultimately, what our job's about. It doesn't really matter what I teach. What matters is what that person takes home at the end of the day. Um, so those conversations can be about that. And, and Carol Levine is a perfect example of that. She is so, she's so savvy in so many ways about ski technique and ski coaching. Um, but we've had lots of good conversations about, um, what's been very hot on the press lately, internal and external cueing. Um, so we'll say, well, I had a student and we were working on this and I had a, this external cue and then we needed to do a little internal language. Um, so they're not those little pearls and those little nuggets are oftentimes about our skiing performance, but they are also more and more about how I'm facilitating somebody else's learning and what kind of language I'm using and what kind of outcomes I'm seeking and how I'm doing with those. Um, and. Kudos to our organization. We're, go we're going someplace. <laughs> How do you see your role on the current team? How do I see my role on the current team? Um, How do I see my role on the current team? I think each team definitely has its own little flavor, a little flair. Um, this team feels like it's maybe the most diverse that I've been a part of. Um, between not belief systems, we all, we all see great skiing as great skiing. Um, I'd like to think that I have a little bit of a voice of experience. And if someone has a question, um, they can come to me. That's, that's kind of an interesting, um, I guess phase of life. Kind of like as you're, as you're growing up as a kid and your parents always take care of you, your parents always take care of you. And then there's like this middle ground and all of a sudden you get to where you're kind of looking out for your parents and your parents are always going to be your parents and always want to take care of you. But that, that starts to shift a little bit. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about with respect to that. And having been on the team for a little while or having been in the industry for a little while, where you go from, I'm going to seek this person out for this and this person out for this and this person knows this to all of a sudden it starts to be where people are looking at, looking to you and seeking information from you. And it kind of happens gradually. And all of a sudden you're like, okay, sort of in that role. Um, which is fantastic, right? Um, so I'd like to think that I, I play a role in that. Definitely play a role in, um, I've been on the teaching skills task force for the last couple of years. So the, the fundamentals and the performance guide that's going to come out. Um, Matt Boyd has been heading that up and it's been, it's been phenomenal to be a part of that with Matt Boyd. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it right there. So what is, what has been your greatest inner ski experience and was it something leaning towards teaching and, and kind of the learning experience or was it something with skiing, like watching one of the countries there look at how they look at skiing. Oh man, the greatest inner ski experience. Um, I think I'm going to share two. <laughs> um, 
So I blew out my ACL the year that we went to Austria. And Rob Sogard, our coach at the time, still invited me to go, which was amazing. So I spent the whole time hobbling around. But this one time where the Canadian coach, John Gillies, um, asked a couple of members from each country to go and, and do a bunch of different skiing tasks. And so he and I sat at the bottom of the hill talking about all the different countries skiing. And it was amazing. There were other coaches there. And it was a total behind the scenes thing. It was like the um, backstage at a rock concert sort of thing. But since I hadn't been able to be out on the hill, I missed a lot of the experience. But this was just like, I learned so much about that. We were talking about, well, the Koreans did this and the Japanese did this. And then a Japanese coach would come down and would be like, why are you guys, you know, talk to me about this. Um, like, for example, uh, the Japanese at that time had a fair amount of upper body rotation in their skiing. And when asked about it, they said, well, we respect our elders so much in this country. We want to make it easy for them, not demanding for them. And so having a little bit of upper body rotation makes it easier. And how cool is that? Like the, their technical skiing was influenced by their respect for their elders. Right. And I never would have cleaned those little bits of information had John not asked all these people to come over and ski one country at a time. But he and I and the other coaches just standing around there talking about it. And I had nowhere to go. I couldn't go very far on crutches. Um, it was awesome. I, I learned a lot. Um, the other one was probably Argentina. Um, because one, I got to do a presentation there and I had never done a presentation at Interski and it scared the daylights out of me and, and I felt like it went well. So I was like, whew, okay, I could do that. <laughs> um, but also we were introducing our alpine skiing fundamentals at that Interski and the dialogue around it was just, it was awesome. Like, um, Jennifer Simpson and I shared a group in explaining what our fundamentals were all about and a dialogue out of that came to be, well, how do you guys look at upper lower body separation? And so we had a long conversation and we're late because we kept skiing a little bit longer with our group. Um, but about half of the countries looked at upper lower body separation from like sternum up. And the other half looked at it where we do kind of from the hips up. And um, so again, not going, well, we're right, you're wrong, but just it, it made me explore that for a really long time. Well, how is it? Where is it? Um, and those are the conversations and, and watching different countries ski, you could absolutely see that in their skiing. Um, but that was, that experience in Argentina was really cool too. So if you could ski anywhere that you haven't, that, that like you could go or what's on your bucket list of, I want to ski this place or this mountain or this country that you haven't done yet. What, what's high on the list? Oh. Anywhere that I haven't. <laughs> or, um, or is it, or is it you want to go back to where you've, where you've gone? Is there like, what's on the bucket list? I want to go back there. So, okay. I would like to go to Chamonix because I'm a language dork <laughs> and I like French and want to learn more French. And Chamonix is just one of those iconic places, right? Never been to. Um, and I would like to go to Alaska. And ski something crazy steep, like from a helicopter. Hmm. <laughs> need, need a caddy? Need a caddy, yes, absolutely. <laughs> caddy. 100%. 100%. And I hate helicopters. I should say that. I hate helicopters in the mountains. Oh. Because they're super... Another one of those challenges. They're super fickle and finicky. <laughs> um, but just looking at some of that terrain, I think that's... Oh, that, that would be on my bucket list. If I could yes. only ski one place for the rest of my life, though, it'd be Portillo, Chile, hands down. Is, is that the, the snow, the mountain? The, what's the draw? Both? Uh, you can ski your pants off without going very far. Um, it's consistent steeps. Um, mind you, I haven't been there in a couple of years. <laughs> um, but it's just the, the ambiance of the place, the the ease of getting to big terrain, um, the snow quality, um, the people you rub elbows with and hang out with. and um, It's just kind of a magical place. 
So if you think about an experience that maybe happened while you were skiing or at an event or something, but what's a great experience or somebody you've met um, around it or outside of skiing that's been like, this really made a difference, even though it might have not been skiing, what's an experience or person you met that's had a big influence on who you are as a ski teacher? Hmm. <laughs> Can I talk about the experience first? And then while I'm talking about that, maybe the yeah. person will come to my mind. Yeah. Um, I had an opportunity six years ago, maybe a couple of different times, but to train the U S ski team athletes on a level three certification. Um, again, I mentioned earlier in this podcast that when something makes me uncomfortable, I, I like to lean into it. Right. Well, that was phew, <laughs> right there. Eric Lipton and I coached the athletes and Michael Rogan and Dave Lyon coached the coaches. And it was at Snowbird. And we were both like, okay, what did we get ourselves into here in the beginning of it? Turns out the guys were just, it was all, all men in Eric and my group. Um, and they were just, they were awesome in the beginning. They were like, I don't know. I don't get this, blah, blah, blah. And then as the week went on and we coached them on, you know, teaching styles, learning styles of everything that a level three instructor would need to know, as well as how to make good low end, relatively low edge angle demonstrations, as well as good high performance skiing. Um, and what stays with me to this day, well, one, Marco Sullivan, we had a conversation about his skiing. And then every time he had an opportunity, he would scooch away and he would start practicing what we, what he and I talked about. And by the end of the week, he was like, Oh my gosh, this is different than what I've been doing. <laughs> Whether it helped him or not in the end, we never, we never followed up in that. Um, but that was pretty cool. But watching these guys that were professional athletes, how they would, like you would give them a little bit of information again and they would just go and problem solve with it. Like, Skiing gates is problem solving, right? <laughs> How do you get around this one and around this one? Go really fast, not slow down, not fall, not lose balance. It's all about problem solving and, and watching the way they approached what Eric and I were coaching them through and how they, like the conversation earlier, they weren't waiting for someone to give them the answer. Like there was never a waiting moment for them. They were constantly looking for clues and, and figuring things out. And that was really poignant in my career. Probably one of the most poignant things as far as what I took home to coaching instructors was how, how we can do a great job setting up problem solving scenarios. It doesn't mean guided misery, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but be clear with things. But again, and that's probably what inspired that presentation I did, Dave, on taking yeah. responsibility for your own um, outcomes. Um, yeah. I still haven't come to a person. That doesn't have um, to be. I just thought there might be. I'm sure there are. I'm sure there's a gazillion <laughs> of them. Yeah. I'll just I'll just blurt them out. I'll let my Tourette's go and I'll go, it was just fine. It's this guy. <laughs> as, we keep, yeah. as we continue talking, if I think of one. Yeah. How, how much do you think it would benefit us if we had more experiences like that with the race world? Even maybe not on the World Cup level, because I know Angela and I, if those guys won't talk to us. But, um, you know, just the, the interaction with USSS and us and, and just people that are coaching racing or doing different things and skiing. You know, Angela had talked a lot, even the freestyle part. Um, Huge. I mean, just like Angela, your question about, you know, how do you relate to someone that teaches skiing part time versus someone who's teaches skiing a week's worth of all day private lessons? Like the more diversity you can put in your bag of tricks, the better. And whether it's the part time and the full time, the little mountain and the big mountain, the ski racing versus the jibbers, the big mountain skiers versus the freestyle bump skiers, the... um I'm about having fun. I don't care how I ski to the person that's like, no, I'm going to go through A, B, C, D. Um, the going in and taking a tennis lesson and learning how that person coaches, the taking a golf lesson and figuring out how you learn. I took a golf lesson a few years ago and, and I got so frustrated because the guy was teaching us these brilliant things. 
and he like I didn't have enough time to practice, so I got pretty frustrated. I'd be like, we'd do it for five shots, and then we'd move on to something else. But, so that taught me a lot about how I learn and how I need I need you to shut up for a little while, <laughs> and I need to give me an opportunity to practice. But yeah, the more the more we can explore different facets of our industry. And our industry might be the education industry, right? So it might be, Angelo, your public school system experience. It might be taking a college class, whatever. But we can explore both the skiing industry, the education industry. Um, the better we're going to be because it changes our perspective. It tweaks our perspective. Sometimes it affirms our beliefs. Sometimes it challenges our beliefs. And sometimes you're like, man... I kind of had that wrong for a little while. <laughs> um, and we grow from all of those. So, so yes, for me, the opportunities I've had to work like with Ron Kip at the level 300 coaches things, the skills quest things. Yes. To, to realize that we're all going left and right down the hill. We have slightly different priorities on what's important to us in racing. Of course, it doesn't really matter what you look like. It matters what the clock sets. Um, in our world, we are demonstrators, like it or not. So it doesn't mean we can't ski fast as long as we're demonstrating what it is we're trying to demonstrate. And that's not always fast. Um, but yeah, the, the more, and I feel like sometimes we feel like, oh, I just don't have enough time in my life to explore those different sides of it. And so we go in the same direction and the same direction and the same direction. And it's actually slowed our progress versus if we went, and and take a more circular path that was more creative, I guess. Yeah. So what is um what's important to you that um you still have you still want influence on? You want to leave your mark and you haven't really left it yet. Is there something out there that like I know I want over the next so many years or decade, I want to make sure I leave this mark on skiing, ski teaching. I am. Did you just ask her to write her epitaph? Dude? <laughs> <laughs> well, I said decade. It could be two sure. decades. <laughs> She's uh, a young, young woman. She made the team when she was six. Exactly. <laughs> Actually, I was six and a half. Right. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to. <laughs> um, I guess a couple things. I, I like the trajectory that I've been on. Mm -hmm. I feel... I feel satisfied, but not complacent, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I would like more people. I look at myself as an athlete. And as much as I think it's nice to be able to go skiing and then go to the bar and have a beer afterwards. Um, I look at myself as an athlete and you can do that sometimes. But if you do that every day then you're compromising yourself being an athlete. And all of us in PSA Aussie are an athlete at some level. Maybe we're weekend athletes, maybe we're elite athletes, somewhere in between there. Um, but if I could influence a little bit people starting to say, if you want to get a level three certification, for example, you need to work your ass off physically and not just on the hill. And, and you need to, if you're going to take a level one, yeah, you need to do some work. But each level that you want to achieve, you have to work commensurate with that level. And if I could get maybe some people to go, ah, I'm not going to have a beer every single night after skiing. Sorry, guys. Um, but I'm going to get up and I'm going to work out or I'm going to go to the gym afterwards. I'm going to go for a run afterwards and look at ourselves more as athletes, I would feel super satisfied. I feel like I've been chipping away at that over the years. Um, I'd also like to see more people show up at our national team tryouts. That's that's dwindled a little bit over the years. Um, so maybe that was give, an invitation, you guys. Maybe um, if you gave away beer. <laughs> maybe if you gave away beer, exactly. You get, you get <laughs> hundreds of people trying out. <laughs> exactly. I'm so see that's one of the things I needed to go whoop, 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 yeah. just so I have some clarity on that. And thank you, Angela. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I'm, I, I'm a I am a problem solver. Yeah. Oh. 
I, I, Angelo, I see the, I see the, um, a presentation at, uh, master's Academy pro gym next, next fall on, um, an athlete being an athlete. I'd be happy to talk to him. Or you mean her? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought you yeah, no, I'm not, talk, uh, no, 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 I'm not looking. Shit. I'll do one too. In I'll the parking lot. Too, Everybody will be in less than Robbins and I'll do mine in the parking lot. <laughs> With beers, right? You'll have beers. <laughs> with your... oh, oh, thousands of people. And oh, beer. <laughs> thousands of people of beer. Oh my God. No, Angela, I, what do you got for a couple? Oh, you got a question? Go ahead. I thought you had No, but I, yeah, uh, I think you said the, the two most important things, Robin, throughout, throughout this hour or whatever, that, that habits are real, you know, and, and getting Wait, out. Wait, can you of, say that again, Angela? I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you talked about habits and, and that's real. And you're trying, you, if you make the claim that you're going to push yourself and do this thing, that's a greater achievement than what you've done before. You have to change some of those habits. And very early on, you mentioned grit, you know, and that's, I think there is no greater example of grit than an instructor who loves Apre saying, you know what, this season, I'm only going to do Apre on, but, you know, I'll, I'll Sunday, I'll have one before I go home on Sunday. But on Saturday, I'm doing, you know, these hop turns with this. Absolutely. This crew. I've, I've been following. Um, she's a mental skills coach for the New York Yankees called Lauren Johnson. And she talks about reps. And obviously, you know, if you go to the gym and you do bicep curls, if you do, you know, so many reps every day and every week and every month and every year. You're going to build your biceps. But she talks about habits being reps too. Mm. And you don't always have to go, like, it's not the intensity of your rep. So you can't go on Saturday, I'm going to be an athlete and then not do it again for the rest of the week. You have to be, you have to do reps every single day. And if you, if you miss one day, well, that's where humans were going to. Don't mm. let yourself miss two days mm. because then mm. you're starting to create a new mm. habit. So it's do the reps and, and whether the reps is, um, you know, physical training and the reps is your gym's closed for COVID, but you can still go do 50 push-ups in that week or 50 push-ups a day, depending on where your, your level is. Um, and maybe someday you only have time to do 10, but get those 10 reps in. Don't skip that day. And again, especially as I mentioned, don't skip two days because then you're reinforcing a new habit. And maybe the rep is, um, the fact that you're going to tell yourself, okay, how can I control this scenario at my exam? I can control this scenario. I'm nervous right now. I can control my breathing. I can breathe in for four and out for four and, and practicing that and, and doing that regularly so that you have regular reps and it's the reps that create the habits. Lauren Johnson. Yeah. Lauren Johnson. Yeah. Are you familiar yeah, with yeah. Angela, Angela Duckworth? Yes. Uh, talks about grit and yes. that's, you know, another piece of it and, ha and understanding, understanding the things you are talking about is, is one of the things that gives people grit that learning is hard, that you are going to probably uh, not meet your goal one day, but then what do you do with the next day? You know, and, and it, it's, it's important. And especially I think now this time of year, we just finished, spring academy i was at, i did a four-day group at j peak and um there you know the, the the theme of the academy for these folks it was awesome was like well here's here's what we're going to do over the summer this is going to be our workout plan over the summer based on some of the things we did on the hill that they liked but recognized that i don't own this yet it's like oh well if i do this activity i'm practicing that move and then when i come back in december it's going to be there and that I thought that's just the great mindset. That's that's mm -hmm. what you that's how you that's how you got to be when you're, you know, we're not all skiing two hemispheres, and um, and most of our members I think are are skiing on on weekends. But what can you do at your desk chair in your office Monday through Friday? You know, that's m make your sit sit there and turn your legs under your desk a hundred times every hour so that that movement is wired in, and then when you get to the hill. On Saturday, it's there. You know? Yeah, close That's your it. eyes for five minutes and visualize yourself doing that movement. Yeah, right. But it's the reps of it that are going to make it stick. Right. Get rid of the chair and get the ball. Sit on the ball. ball. 
Yeah. Yeah, get the big medicine ball. Sit in the ball, man. And I know Steve DeBenedictus. Yeah. Steve DeBenedictus, that's his office chair up at Bretton Woods. It is. You go in, there's a, there's a ball, there's no chair. He sits on the ball. You talked about that Title IX. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was standing on the ball in that one. <laughs> was you? Yeah, we were going to ask you about that. We have it. It's, uh, we, we heard you did some modeling as like a second job to, to kind of supplement <laughs> the ski teaching job back in, I don't know, the 2012 or 13, somewhere there. Yeah, I think I my stint with Title IX wasn't a second job as much as it was, um, <laughs> A, I thought it was really cool. My friends and family thought it was super cool to get a catalog and see me standing on a stability ball there. And I got some super cool clothes out of it. <laughs> there you go. Got what some was, swag. The was the caption of that picture? Robin Barnes is really on the ball. Yeah. Ooh. But um, oh. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Hey, 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 Angelo, to, should we hmm. should we tell Robin what we were thinking? That picture that's pretty iconic on Facebook to, uh, with Michael and her, and she's kind of flying with Michael's holding her up for the feet. We, should we tell her what we were talking about last night? Yeah, you yes. can tell her. Yeah, 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 we were we were thinking that you know all the crew was together last night, and um, you know since Brian Dolan is, is is so tight with Michael, we were thinking that you know Michael would have Brian flying like you were on his feet there. We need a photo of that maybe next year at the Pro Jam <laughs> Masters Academy. What do you think? Okay, duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael and I have probably about forty of those pictures. Yeah. Um. When we first started dating, we went camping with his parents at North Lake in New York. And we just spontaneously did that like over a cliff. And I'm like, all right, I guess I'm trusting this guy. <laughs> but um, yeah, we've done it all over the world, different spots. <laughs> I wish I had them all in one place. I wish I could say that we were smart enough to have done that, but we haven't. Um, I'll have to get, get Rogan doing some squats in the gym to strengthen his legs a little bit to hold up Dolan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think Dolan better a, get in the gym, become more of an athlete, so he can stay up there. <laughs> <laughs> Tell him it's about the reps. It's, it's about, about the reps. reps. That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, Angel, you have the you have the, you have those fun closing questions you always have. Yeah, what's a lazy day for Robin Barnes look like? What's a lazy day? Oh, a day off baking cookies. Ooh. Nice. Yep. Nice. Yeah, a day off baking cookies. I. I I find that very relaxing, therapeutic. Um, yeah. My the only other one I wrote down was who's your favorite member of the PSA Aussie national team? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you knew he was gonna have that one. Uh, <laughs> she's very silent on that. There he is. Hey, <laughs> there it is, the cameo. He cried. <laughs> Oh God, that was no. beautiful. The, um, <laughs> I know who his favorite team member is. Yeah, so he's already told us that. <laughs> we have a um, we're it's a pretty it's a pretty bitching team. Yeah, yeah. So, it really is. So, yeah, so, yeah, I, I kind of like that guy who just stuck his head in there too. Yeah, yeah, he does pretty good. So, we also, hey, do you have any stories of any of the staff from these? Hey, Robin, do you have any stories or any funny kind of things of any of our staff here from the east? In your experiences out here? Um, yeah, one of my favorites is Bob Shostick. Um, I was fairly new in the Eastern Division and I was under, was I understudying him? No, I was, I think we were jointly giving a level one exam and he was doing his exam. I didn't know him really well, but what I knew of him, I thought he was a pretty cool cat. Um, big guy, kind of, Kind of then that was oof, 20 years ago, maybe. Um, I think he kind of liked that he was a little bit intimidating because he was so big and, you know, he knew a lot of stuff. So, um, so I brought my group over to his group and I'm like, you guys check this out. <laughs> and I said, Hey, Bob, that's a really nice hat you're wearing. And he goes, thanks, Robin. <laughs> and I said, does that come in a men's model too? <laughs> 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 and, uh, and of course he thought it was hilarious and i feel like he and i have gotten along super well ever since then um i absolutely adore the guy but i'll never ever forget that talking about leaning <laughs> into things that make you uncomfortable <laughs> yeah. yep. and, and what's we're never gonna forget it either 
No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Oh. So um, thanks so much for doing this with us, Robin, and Michael, who was there too, for coming on earlier in the year. We hope you guys will possibly come on next year. Um, Angela, I'm going to do some stuff over the summer also, but um, definitely we get rolling for more ski stuff in the fall, winter. Um, hopefully you guys will think of coming on, maybe some specific topics and folks have been asking us for some things would be awesome if you consider that. And well, maybe uh, we'll, maybe we'll be able to sit down with them for a minute at, at pro, pro, pro jam, jam masters. Yeah. We're thinking of that. Oh, that would be fantastic. That would be fun. Yeah. yeah. Be fantastic. Yeah. And, um, yeah, any, any topics, again, I, there's been all kinds of webinars and stuff out there, but I think what you guys are doing specifically is super important. You're keeping it light. You're keeping it <laughs> hopefully interesting. Uh, at least the ones I've listened to have been interesting. Um, and and I applaud what you do and admire what you do. So thank you for it. Thank you. And thanks for being on. My pleasure. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, well, thanks. And uh, thanks everybody out there for listening. And I hope you enjoy this podcast with the fall line with KS and company. Thank you, Robin. <laughs>